of now what the universe is. Space and outer space, a coagulation that becomes a nebula. And out of the nebula, millions of galaxies. And out of this constellation of galaxies comes forth our home galaxy, the Milky Way. A group of some 400 billion stars orbiting a galactic center. And of those 400 billion stars, the one orbiting star that is closest to us is the Sun. And planets orbit around it. And among those planets is our little planet. Looks like the Sun and all the galaxies also came out of that nebula. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. That's one small step for man. And our particular planet was not too far from this sun. And not too close. Not too hot. Or too cold. So then, out of this earth of ours have come fauna and flora and bacteria. fish and lions and lambs out of this earth have come we as the eyes and the ears and the consciousness and the breathing of the earth itself as its children. And since the Earth came out of space, is it any wonder that the laws of space live in us? When Galileo recognized that the law of ballistics on this Earth operates on other planets, he began something that came to fulfillment and fruition in our moonwalks. Because when the astronauts were asked, after going around the moon, who navigated, they answered, Newton. How is it that we can ascertain something here with absolute certainty, something that pertains over there? In other words, the laws of time and space were precisely known to man, as are the laws within our own heads. They are already in us, because we all come from the same galaxy, the same nebula, the same universe. And so we reach the point. Why do we see opposites in one another? Why is there any division whatsoever? We all exist in the same atmosphere. Why then do we separate and distinguish? I'm interested neither in black power or great but human power and all of Calm and lame. We are earthling, for we are human. Animal. 
tree. Not the same, but equal. Just consider the root of the word universe. Uni equals one, as in unite. Union, unanimous. And verse equals turn or change, as in reverse or versatile. Therefore, the word universe quite literally means all turn into one. As Carl Sagan and Anne Druyan wrote, the creatures with which we are concerned, namely us, were not so long ago noisy, quarrelsome, clever, tool-using, with prolonged childhoods and tender regard for their young. One thing led to another, and in a twinkling, their descendants had multiplied all over the planet, killed off all their rivals, devised world-transforming technologies, and posed a mortal danger to themselves and to many other beings with whom they shared their small, Home. It is a common trait we primitive organisms seem to share, a weakness for territoriality. Which not only prevents man's understanding of their fellow earthlings, their fellow beings, but of the cosmos. Which we are only a fraction of a part. It's easy to think of us as isolated from the cosmos, a self-sufficient world minding its own business. But all cannot be understood if we imagine the Earth hermetically sealed from the rest of the universe with only a little sunlight trickling in from the outside. Out there and down here are not separate compartments. The sky and the earth are one. Each of us is a tiny being, permitted to ride on the outermost skin of one of the smallest planets in this solar system. And only for a few dozen trips around our local star which means we each inhabit a frighteningly shallow zone of environmental clemency. However, because we are such primitive organisms, always striving against each other for power and supremacy, we conquer in order to maintain a few more inches on which to stand triumphant. But in a universe, beyond measure. Due to this territoriality, we also streamline the destinies of weaker Earthlings into extinction or ruin. And then have the audacity to claim their chosen patch on the surface of the sphere as our own, if only for a brief period of time. The longest lived organisms on Earth endure for about a millionth of the age of our planet. To be blunt, we are fleeting, transitional characters. And our tiny, fragile world is lost in a cosmic ocean vastly beyond our most courageous imaginings. So despite all our posturing, all our imagined self-importance, self-congratulatory chauvinism, Clearly, we as human beings have not been given the lead in this rather epic cosmic drama. Perhaps someone else has. Perhaps no one else has. In either case, we have a good reason for humility. If we were randomly inserted into the cosmos, 
The chance that we would find ourselves on or near a planet would be less than one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. In everyday life, such odds are called compelling. Worlds are precious. The distances in the physical world have been replaced by distances in the mind. The world is a projection of the ego, and what we see as human tragedy is the effect of all those egos. The consequences of which we experience collectively as society. The great Hindu sage, Sri Ramana, called our persona the apparent actor. This persona is essentially the mask or appearance one projects to the world. Basically, it's the ego whose function is to separate, to divide into classes, to create duality. For the ego ideal is to be a soul ideal. It's all about me. How can I win? How can I dominate? How can I impress? How can I be the best? But at the expense of what? This is why everything we see is the result of our thoughts. You think you think them, and so you think you see them. The inner world then is the cause of the outer world. Therefore, in order to surrender the ego and find true peace of mind, we have to have neutral thoughts. There are times when this world appears on the brink of degenerating into massacre. Somehow, the population has adopted a great apathy. We see an increased apathy towards suffering, human and animal alike. By definition, apathy reflects a lack of interest in things one does not consider important. But where did this apathy come from? It's as if society is growing numb oblivious to any equality, blinded by ego, by gain. And yet, the gain of what? The gain of objects? The gain of lines on a map? Human beings are so selfish, they will kill others for money. Of course, for any kind of gain. That's a pretty common one, to value money over life. In fact, the ego often prizes this species we call money over humanity, over all expressions of life. But how can we answer to our own conscience? Time is so temporary, so impermanent. Nothing material endures. Because only a few years of existence separate birth from death. So this is a reality that won't last. Therefore, there's no such thing as fame and fortune and power over others. Selling out integrity for power over others is an error. You're sacrificing it all for an illusion. Clearly, there's within the human that which is almost reptilian, those who wantingly kill others for the fun of killing. That hasn't been eliminated and still expresses itself quite strongly in some people. To witness humankind in this state as pieces unto themselves is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because their hearts are broken. All strangers to the truth. And yet, ironically, 
all strangers of the same blood. Human. If humans, in the physical sense, are all strangers of the same blood, then, on the purely molecular level, how tragically senseless or absurd and futile is war. The war of being against being. The idea of countries or superpowers willing to wipe out all human life at one point or another in history because of political differences. And they do it all over the planet, century after century. Each one a jealous rival of the next. Mankind has been at war for 95% of recorded history. How many times do we have to die in war before we realize how absurd it is? The sheer irony of political leaders on both sides being seriously prepared to incinerate millions of people out of some misguided sense of national interest. When they were planning the mega bomb, the idea was if they lost the war, they would destroy all of human life. Actually, mega is a fitting term because that's what we also call megalomania. That's the sadistic nature of the superego. Power and money and control. One succumbs to the glamour of all that. One of the great seducers is glamour. The glamour of success. The glamour of prestige. Megalomaniacs have no common sense. Megalomaniacs don't care if their entire country gets wiped out. That's the degree of insanity. Megalomania, you might say, is the extreme opposite of what divinity would be. They almost hate humans. Hate humanity. Why then do we put our trust in such leaders? Such dictators. The wars being waged now will seem as meaningless to people a hundred years from now as the theological conflicts of the Middle Ages appear to us today. But when will human beings grasp this concept? What generation will come forth and mark the turning point of all civilizations by eliminating war from this planet? This very notion of war must end if we are to evolve any closer to enlightenment. Awareness, consciousness, and unity. For this reason, wars, once and for all, must become a thing of the past. And only that. For even there, how they pockmark human history. Therefore, our desire should be to never experience war again. 19th century civilians couldn't possibly fathom the wars to come in the 20th century, wherein millions would die. A very high price to pay. But for us, now, in the 21st century, we can only look back somberly and acknowledge it has already been paid. Oh, if only we could go back in time and somehow warn our 19th century ancestors of the wars ahead, the terrible wars to come. Which wars, they'd ask? Against whom? When speaking of human history, we recount the rise and fall of nations and ideas. Or, as historians Will and Ariel Durant surmised, retell sad stories of the death of kings. Is it possible that, after all, human history has no sense, that it teaches us nothing, and that the immense past was only the weary rehearsal 
of the mistakes that the future is destined to make on a larger stage and scale. It's almost as if, in our struggles for power, we are actually confronted by the threat of peace. Why can't we seem to share power peacefully and get back to the basic things that matter? Sadly, too often, the only thing we do share is our distrust of one another. During the Mutiny on the Bounty, Fletcher Christian hoped to avert disaster, beseeching his crew by saying, we have only to persuade society of something they already know. That inhumanity is its poorest servant. What else is there to be served by war? This wind of destruction. For soldier and civilian alike, the sight of war, its bloodshed, death, and destruction is a shock from which we recover only slowly, if at all. War is not neutral and does not permit us to remain neutral. Whomever sees war quakes, mysteriously shaken to the core. Those were Victor Hugo's words, paraphrased, when writing of the battle at Waterloo. But they seem applicable to any war, and also betray a relevance years ahead of their time. Why, with all our technology and wisdom, all our religions, our 12-step programs, and self-help books, why are we still such savages? Are we not all Earthlings, each and every one of us, energy bodies? And as for the human race, all connected by the same human blood, and therefore all kin. There is a level of consciousness which we all share, in so much as we all share a human body. Even with the dogs and cats and mammals and vertebrae. Because we all share an animal body. By then, we all share the same impulses that animals have. To sleep. To reproduction. aggression and winning through for they are also clinging to life begetting building nests making their way Sometimes, life is monstrous, and there is often a sense of horror. What is it that life does? It has to kill and eat other life? An eternal treadmill of living by killing. The whole world is involved in slaughter and bloodshed, and we have all been part of a vast, interlocking, murdering machine. And the slain were left to rot. And give their blood here. In the merciless sun. As Henry Miller stated. Which only indicates our persistence in the primitiveness of self-interest. So what can we hope? from this killing of life, this killing of kin. 
Men still tear one another to pieces. Humanity against humanity. For the sake of humanity. What logic is there in this living by killing? How can we care for power, pleasure, our own lives even, when all these others, kinsmen, civilians, humans and earthlings alike, must perish? How can we dare spill the blood that unites us? The destruction of war impacts all life, human, animal, tree. collapse of unity. For in our efforts to defend the rights of some, we assault the rights of others. This has been the formula throughout the history of man. The arc of human history is long, lamented Dr. King, but it bends towards justice. Indeed, to look back at the history of human rights is a long, unbroken line. Here, the most frightful, vengeful massacres have been perpetrated again and again throughout the endless, bloody past of man. At first, there were no rights, human or otherwise. If you were in with the right crowd, you were safe. But if you weren't, then you weren't. Until a man named Cyrus the Great decided to change all that. After conquering Babylon, he did something completely revolutionary. He announced that all slaves were free to go. He also said people had the freedom to choose their religion, no matter what crowd they were a part of. They documented these words on a clay tablet known as the Cyrus Cylinder. And that was the birth of human rights. The idea spread quickly to Greece, to India, and eventually to Rome. They noticed that people naturally follow certain laws, even if they weren't told to. They called this natural law, but it kept getting trampled by those in power. Not until a thousand years later, in England, did a king agree that no one can overrule the rights of the people, not even a king? People's rights were finally recognized, and they were now safe from those in power. Almost. It still required a group of British rebels declaring their independence before the king realized that all men are created equal. This isn't to say he liked the idea, but he couldn't stop them. Thus, America was born. The French immediately followed with their own revolution for their own rights. Their list was even longer, and they insisted that these rights weren't just made up, they were natural. The Roman concept of natural law had become natural rights. Unfortunately, not everyone agreed. In France, a general named Napoleon decided to overthrow the new French democracy and crown himself emperor of the world. He almost succeeded. But the countries of Europe joined forces and defeated him. Human rights were again recognized, and they drew up international agreements broadly granting many rights across Europe, but only across Europe. Somehow, the rest of the world still didn't qualify. Instead, they were invaded, conquered, and consumed by Europe's massive empires. Until, like Cyrus the Great, a young man from India decided to change all that too. His name was Mahatma Gandhi, and in the face of violence, he insisted that all people of Earth had rights, not just in Europe. Eventually, even Europeans started to agree, but this was not easy. Two world wars erupted. Hitler exterminated half the Jewish population of Earth in horrifying Nazi death camps. All told, 90 million people died. 
Never had human rights been so terrifyingly close to extinction. And never had the world been more desperate for change. Accordingly, the countries of Earth banded together and formed the United Nations. Their basic purpose was to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person. But what were these human rights? Were they the proclamations of Cyrus, the natural laws of Rome, the declarations of France? Everyone seemed to have a slightly different idea of what human rights should be. However, under the supervision of Eleanor Roosevelt, they finally agreed on a set of rights that applied to absolutely everyone, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The French concept of natural rights had finally become human rights. So, to summarize, at first only the fortunate ones had any rights, until one person decided that other people should have rights as well. Except not everyone agreed. And it took a few thousand years of fighting and declarations and more fighting until everyone finally concluded that human rights should apply to all. And one would think they all lived happily ever after, except for one problem. If people have the right to food and shelter, why are 16,000 children dying of starvation every day? One every five seconds. If people have freedom of speech, why are thousands imprisoned for speaking their minds? If people have the right to education, why are over a billion adults unable to read? If slavery has truly been abolished, why are 27 million people still enslaved today? The fact is, when it was signed, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights did not have the force of law. It was optional. And despite many more documents, conventions, treaties, and laws, it's still little more than words on a page. So the question is, who will make those words a reality? I have a dream to make. When Dr. King marched for racial equality, he was marching for rights that had been guaranteed by the United Nations for almost two decades. But still, he marched. When Nelson Mandela stood up for social justice in the 1990s, his country had already agreed to abolish such discrimination for nearly 40 years, but still he fought. Those who fight today against torture, poverty, and discrimination are not giants or superheroes. They're people, kids, mothers, fathers, and teachers. They are free-thinking individuals who refuse to be silent, who realize that human rights are not a history lesson. They're not words on a page. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home. So then, how should we nourish these bodies, encircling our consciousness? Well, for starters, we know that we are what we eat. When it comes to nutrition, we now know that everything you eat and drink has an effect on your mind and body. To state the startling fact right off, it is almost an accepted consequence of modern life that we will succumb to some type of degenerative illness sooner than we would expect. That's the karma of protoplasm. Everyone wants to have more energy, of course. But one particular function of the human body demands a great deal of energy. And that is the digestion of food. As Harvey Diamond outlines, we need to understand the effect food has on the length and quality of one's life and inform people how to eliminate the cause of their health problems rather than constantly battle the effects of violating these natural laws that govern our bodies. Simply put, any food the body can't use becomes toxic and becomes waste.
Isn't it interesting that we eat in such a way as to not cleanse, but pollute our bodies? We actually eat in such a way as to clog them. That's why there are so many heart bypass operations per year. Because people's arteries are so clogged. Just consider all the mammals. Have you ever seen a fat tiger or impala in the wild? Have you ever seen animals in nature that have lost their teeth and used false teeth to eat? Or have hearing aids to hear? Or have glasses so they can see? Or are wearing toupees because they went bald? Or have pacemakers to make their hearts pump? or dialysis machines for their kidneys. Have you ever heard of a million animals in a year dying of heart disease? Or cancer? Or strokes? Or diabetes? Animals in nature are magnificently healthy in comparison to the health that we humans experience. Their bodies are not clogged and they're not overweight. That is why they experience a state of physical health much superior to ours. Since meat is generally thought to be the most ideal source of protein, think of some of the strongest animals on the planet. Elephants, oxen, horses, mules, camels, water buffalo. And what do they eat? leafy matter, grass, and fruit. All nutritive material is formed in the plant kingdom. That is why all the animals of strength, particularly those whose strength we harness, have all the protein they need. And as such, it's far more important for us to think in terms of how much fruit or vegetables we're going to eat during the day than how much protein. But here's the real truth. Because we eat animals, they end up killing us after we've killed them. In essence, the human loses. He loses when he wins. He dies when he kills. The heart is at the center of it all. Therefore, heart disease points to what? Food as the culprit. Food that cannot be eliminated. So, on one hand, we have food industries, and even governments, claiming the benefits of eating meat. And on the other, we have our common sense, finding that point of view very hard to swallow. Literally. One could even argue that humans do all they can to actually make meat look more like fruit. We alter its texture, change its shape, sweeten it, make it smoother, rounder. We even reintroduce smells of the earth back into the meat by seasoning it with herbs, all of which come from plants. The same could even be said for the processing of dairy products. All mammals take milk from their mothers during infancy but then they are weaned and spend the remainder of their lives sustained by other foods. Nature dictates that we are to be weaned at an early age. Humans, however, are the only species on Earth who continue drinking milk after infancy. And what's stranger still 
is that we don't drink our own milk, but rather the milk of another species. We much prefer drinking cow's milk, even though it's intended for baby cows. Like humans, cows only produce milk when they have babies. But to us, the babies are byproducts. Millions and millions of them each year. And we don't want all those babies. So, we take their mother's milk for ourselves. And all the baby calves are killed. If not used to make more milk. This is how one affects the other. Joseph Campbell taught that the primal image of life is all too often this massive, consuming monster. Which would not even be here if it were not consuming life. Or to put it another way, relying on death, living by killing. If the definition of incarnate is consciousness embodied in flesh. Then, as protoplasm, are we not here to evolve beyond the primal function? Leonardo da Vinci stated, the time will come when men shall look upon the murder of animals as they now look upon the murder of men. That was 500 years ago. Henry David Thoreau suggested that it is part of the destiny of the human race in its gradual improvement to leave off eating animals. As surely as the savage tribes have left off eating each other. That was 150 years ago. Martin Luther King Jr. expressed that one day the absurdity of the almost universal belief in the slavery of other animals will be palpable. We shall then have discovered our souls and become worthier of sharing this planet with them. And that was less than 50 years ago. And so we must reconcile consciousness to this rather monstrous, self-consuming thing and not remain on the primitive level indefinitely. This is what we call Metamorphosis. This is how we evolve beyond the one's primal image of life. Wherein living by killing is transformed into living by loving. Living by loving may be the ultimate solution to all of humankind's difficulties, problems, confusion, and anguish. Krishnamurti discloses that most of us want the security of loving and being loved. But what is love? Everybody talks of love. Every magazine and newspaper and every missionary talks of everlasting love. I love my country. I love my king. I love some book. I love that mountain. I love pleasure. 
I love my wife. I love God. Is love an idea? The church has defined it in one way. Society another. Adoring someone. Sleeping with someone. The emotional exchange. The companionship. Is that what we mean by love? Can love be divided into the sacred and the profane? The human and the divine? Or is there only love? Is love of the one and not of the many? If I say I love you, does that exclude the love of anyone else? Is love personal or impersonal? Moral or immoral? Family or non-family? All these questions indicate, don't they, that we have ideas about love? Ideas about what it should or shouldn't be? A pattern or a code developed by the culture in which we live? One might ask, why is it that obscenity is always connected to sex instead of to war or even bigotry? government says, go and kill for the love of your country. Is that love? Religion says, give up sex for the love of God. Is that love? Is love desire? For most of us, it is desire with pleasure. The pleasure that is derived through the senses. This belonging to another, being psychologically nourished by another, depending on another. In all this, there must always be anxiety, fear, jealousy, guilt. And so long as there is fear, there is no love. And so love is not to do with pleasure and desire. Don't you know now what it really means to love somebody? To love without hate, without jealousy, without anger, without wanting to interfere with what he or she is doing or thinking. Without condemning, without comparing. Where there is love, is there comparison. When you love someone with all your heart, with your entire mind, with all your body, with your entire being, is there comparison to something else? No, because there is nothing else. When you totally abandon yourself to that love, there is not the other. It's non-dual. It's unity. Really, to care is to care as you would for a tree or a plant, watering it studying its needs, the best soil for it, looking after it with gentleness and tenderness. The world is an educational institution, and every creature in it is trying to learn a lesson. Now, what is the lesson to be learned? The lesson to be learned is egolessness. To quench ego. To cancel the noise of I and mine. 
This is my body. These are my thoughts. These are my words. This is my country, etc. My tears. My family. My nation. My belief. My religion. All that ugliness. It is all inside you. In this torn desert world, there is no love because pleasure and desire play the greatest roles. Yet without love, your daily life has no meaning. And you cannot have love if there is no beauty. But as Eckhart Tolle wrote, at the heart of consciousness lies the transcendence of thought, the newfound ability of rising above thought, of realizing a dimension within ourselves that is infinitely more vast than thought. Then love has no opposite. Then love has no conflict. It means that you are not seeking, not wanting, not pursuing. There is no center at all. Then there is love. And that's how you find it. Krishnamurti concluded by saying, You know, intellectually, that the unity of humankind is essential, and that love is the only way. This is the universal principle of compassion. Out of many, one. After all, what is the meaning of life if not to elevate our level of consciousness? Was it only to have a family, to list one's accomplishments, or seek advancement? Was there some enterprise we had sought to master? Was it only being a success in the eyes of the world? Was it all a pursuit of fame? Killing ourselves for recognition. Are we only addicted to attention? Glory? Pleasure seeking? Was progress our only obsession? Consuming things, our defining quality. More capital, more comforts. It's not that these things are wrong, but what is the real meaning of life? To be an air breather? What is the average mortality table of human beings, anyway? 80, 85 years? So with all that getting, get understanding. Because the only achievement we take with us when we die is our level of consciousness, nothing else. What does this vast and mysterious universe of ours have to do with the human struggle, our conflicts, our wars? What does war, for that matter, have to do with what we consume? Moreover, what does consumption have to do with unconditional love? And what does love, in fact, what does any of this really have to do with energy, or states of higher consciousness, or unity? 
Are these not separate issues? Separate pieces? Separate compartments? Or are they all interrelated within the fabric of mortal life? Across the cosmic horizon, space is expanding faster than the speed of light. And though we come out of space, out of the universe, our physical lives are fleeting. How can this be? Reason demands a better answer, and that answer is given. Our life on Earth has only one end and purpose, to identify our physical bodies with our energy bodies, the physical self with the eternal self, that part of us which will never cease to exist. Organizations form groups, and groups create parts. And parts are not unity. Because all causality, all theology, all science, all religion are still in the dualistic frame of mind. If God is indeed infinite, then spiritual reality means there is no holy land or promised land, no geological favoritism, no Bodhi tree or Mecca or Jerusalem or Vatican or Salt Lake City, no group outside of which there is no salvation. No special races, cultures, or chosen people. This separation from wholeness is the only lack in this world of ours. The universe is there, here, all around us. It is in being, it is in process, and we, in all our disequilibrium, are learning to accord with this process and to have compassion for all that lives, to suffer the sorrow of every creature within our own hearts. Harmonious relationships come from compassion with suffering and understanding of the other being. In whatever form they have taken in this life. The spectrum of life on this planet is multitudinous. And so we must evolve beyond separation based on form beyond perceiving opposites, beyond dualities, and the primal image of life. Remember, the very definition of universe means all turned into one. That is why we call it metamorphosis. The child becomes the parent. The acorn becomes the mighty oak. The caterpillar becomes the butterfly. And the primal human being becomes enlightened. So instead of a limited race, a universal, limitless all. We must go beyond these pairs of opposites. 
As we evolve closer and closer to Homo Spiritus, we become attracted to that which is benign. We increase in sensitivity. We think a kind thought for all the world. Because unity is compassion for all things. It's a more powerful level of consciousness. Because one's conscious level is more consistent with every expression of life. Humanity is more than a unity. It is a complete unit. And combined with all conscious life, all earthlings, all beings, it is a great unit. No one part or one unit can be separated from the whole. Human, animal, or tree, not the same, but equal.